Lovely. Well, thank you, everyone. Welcome to the bit that I enjoy the most. This is our lightning talks. We have five of them uh, up today. Lightning talks today, lightning talks tomorrow. Uh, they have five minutes uh, to describe something interesting to us. Um, and we keep them very much that time. Uh, we'll give you a one minute warning for the end and I'll be sitting there. And uh, we're pretty militant about it. So um, you don't want to see the consequences. But Sam, are you ready to go? Ready to go. Love stuffs. All right, and go. Okay, thanks everybody for sticking around. Um, this is um, probabilistic time series forecasting with Facebook Profit. Um, I'll unpack that. Um, this is just me kicking the tires on a, on a package that Facebook released, um, I think like th three, three months ago. Um, so it's my details here, and there's a notebook. Um, you can find um, this sort of uh, this, this, this um, in material. So it's this old problem. Something happened yesterday. Will it happen to tomor tomorrow? There's ton tons of people who you know, worked, worked on this, and we've all, all, all worked on this. Um, so um, this is just to have a picture in your mind of where we're going. Um, there's sort of, here's some time series data. It's actually um, Uber New, New York data and um, the number of trips on, on the y-axis. And this package is just trying to model um, that time series data so you can kind of predict away. Uh, we've got this sort of growth um, and it's sort of useful for modeling, um, you know, demand um, for these, these types of services. So here is, here is um, Facebook Profit um, landing page. You can find that. Um, just, just search for that. Um, it's sort of got some basic documentation. And it's available in Python and R. And there's a paper as well describing the model. And there's, there you are on GitHub, um, 3,000 stars sort of as of today. So yeah, the, um, Facebook get the word out very well about their, their libraries. And there's lots of people who seem to like this. So here, here it is. Um, these guys uh, made uh, this, this, mod, this, um, this library. Um, it's modeling just a single time series with a daily timestamp. And it's got a scikit-learn-like API, so sort of fit predict. And under the hood, it's got Stan doing probabilistic modeling of the model parameters. Um, so you, that helps sort of get the uncertainties on, on the forecast. And the actual time series model has these, like a linear or nonlinear growth with change point detection and specification. So sort of Facebook um, might release a new feature. And so they want to kind of impose a, a constraint on, on this model, say things are changing after this. Um, and there's these weekly and yearly um, periodic um, components model in Fourier space. Um, they don't have a daily component yet. And you can also specify holidays. Um, so like the Super Bowl or, or um, sort of other things going on. So it takes a pandas data frame as input, and you've got these model parameters that go in, the change points and the holidays. Um, and the output is this um, data frame with forecasts and uncertainties um, and the model components. So you can sort of look at, look at what those individual components look like. So I've done a demo just aggregating um, this sort of freedom of information in um, 4 mil 14 million Uber rides. Um, that Nate Silver sort of got hold of um, some, sometime in 2015. You can get the details there. So just to sort of look at the, the API there, you've got sort of, it's like you're familiar with that from, from scikit-learn. You, you instantiate a model, and you, you fit on the data. Um, you can sort of make a future to sort of do some forecasts and then you know, plot the models. And that's what I, what I showed, you, showed you before. So it's um, very sort of clean. Um, clean access to this, this uh, model. You can in inspect the components. So the top, top one is um, we've got sort of time, and then there's this sort of trend component, and you can see the change points there. Um, these are the, the holidays, um, the holiday components. Um, so it seems, in this, at least in this model, um, those, those federal holidays, there was less, um, less rides for Uber um, on, on those days. And then you've got this weekly component down here. Um, so Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you can see um, you've got a high signal, high signal to noise detection of the fact that at this time in New York, people sort of use Uber more on um, like Friday, Friday and Saturday relative to mon Monday and Tuesday. So th that's, um, that's pretty much the, the end of my, my presentation was just to sort of walk you through um, what, what, um, what, a, what a Facebook profit um, looks like. So that's, that's everything. Thank you. So I'll just be quickly uh, evangelizing about this new tool for helping you use Jupyter Notebooks in source control better. So if you were here for the tutorials yesterday, one of the negative things about Jupyter Notebooks was it's difficult to use them in uh, source control like Git. So I'm here to tell you that within the last year, we've hopefully made a solution that will, will help you use Jupyter Notebooks in 
source control like git. So here I've taken a, I'm going to do a live demo from one of the uh, repositories that we used for the tutorials yesterday, the clickbait uh, tutorial. So I ran this and then we generated the output. So I wanted to see, you know, if you use standard git and to try to tell you what this change, you get a lot. So you can see here there's a lot of metadata that has changed and if you keep going there's a lot of stuff that has changed. That was an image, that big blob of green text, there was a figure that was added. This is an HTML table and there is some more metadata here at the end. So that's the existing tool if you use git diff. If I now use our tool and I'm going to add um, this one option here saying I just want to see the source differences. I want to see what has changed in the source. It gives you a nice print saying that uh, we added this one cell and it, this has this source. And you can also say give me everything um, except metadata. Oops, that's a typo. And it will give you here also the output. Still, it's you know quite a bit of a big dump. Uh, but at least if you go up, the uh, the things like the the, uh, the big images has been instead of the base 64 string, you've been replaced by just a, a a snippet saying this has changed. So you don't get this huge base 64 input out, out. And of course, if you're not working in the terminal but want to work on in, in the web browser like you normally would do with the Jupyter Notebook, you also also have a web interface for this where you can say that here we've added a cell with this source. And down here, we actually ran this uh, cell and we got this, uh, this output down here. This is a table that's, an, that's rendered as it would be in, in a notebook. And then you can see the unchanged cells here. Here you can see the figure that was added, this base 64 thing, and then another output here. And uh, so that's the diffing part. We also have added a merge driver. For those of you who use the normal git merge driver, if you see this, that you have a conflict previously, uh, that would often mean that now your Jupyter Notebook was corrupt and you couldn't open it anymore. So with our new driver, we do this intelligent diff and intelligent merge. So if I now open up this uh, notebook that is in conflict, it is actually a valid notebook. And if you scroll down, you can see that this is the output that was added. This is the previous. You can see that the only thing that actually changed was the text plane representation and not the actual PNG. That means that just the, the memory hash that, uh, uh, Jupyter, uh, that uh, IPython uses internally has changed, which is normally uninteresting. And then you can see here in the source, you get this normal uh, merge markers inside the actual source. You can see you just change here a line saying plot with the green color instead of a blue. And then you can see the uh, output further down with the changed color. So now hopefully both merging and, and diffing should be a lot easier for you if you use this tool. And it's just called nbdyne for notebook diffing and merging. Just the first letters of diffing and merging. So if you Google that pip install nbdyne, it should hopefully work. We released the new version on yesterday. So hopefully now, <laughs> so that should be a pretty, pretty uh, mature now in terms of <laughs> release, so yeah. All right, that's all I have. So thanks for your attention. Yeah, so that was a timely talk because I'm also going to talk about Jupyter Notebooks, but not how you can upload into a Git repository or something like that. Something actually much more simple, um, just until my slides come up. Um, so when I was an academic, I never used uh, Jupyter Notebooks. I don't know how I used to work without it. Now that I'm in, in the private sector, um, it's a, as you know, it's a lifesaver. I'm preaching to the choir. Um, just before, so I'm basically going to explain one work, workflow system that I developed for myself, which is quite simplistic, um, and that's what I'm going to explain right now. Uh, just before I start, does anybody, did anybody hear of RunnyPy or use it? Show of hands, RunnyPy? No? Okay, so one hand. So if I get one convert today, then I did my job. Uh, so basically what, it, what happens is when you do it in the exploratory phase and you're ready to pr uh, mass produce a, a product for a client, uh, some so, let's say some sort of analysis, but you're, in my case, for example, I analyze one state in the United States, let's say I do it on New Jersey, but then I want to extrapolate it on 10 other states. 
Well, one can make the argument, well, you did it in the Jupyter Notebook. Well, download it as a Py script and just run it over in, in parallel. That, that, that's all nice. But what you really want to do is use the, Jupyter, Jup, the, the, the strength of the Jupyter Notebook to log everything, all the stats of interest, all the figures. And that's where I find uh, a module like RunnyPy is very useful. And what it is basically it takes advantage of the fact that um, the Jupyter Notebook is just a JSON file. And so you can run it uh, with RunnyPy, you can run it from, from the bash line. And so you can feed it variables and things like that. So, I do, so what I did in, in, in a few projects is what I do is I do my, um, like in, in one notebook, I do my um, analysis until I'm happy. And then I want to mass produce. So then I can uh, just clone everything and I, I can parallelize it and use RunnyPy in order to feed um, in order to feed a parameter. For example, uh, I want to do Arkansas, and then I want to do um, Arizona, et cetera. Uh, and then, well, I don't want to go over 20 or, or, or maybe 50 different notebooks just to see if something went wrong and needs uh, special care. Well, then what I do is I create a master notebook in which I pull the information from, um, from the notebooks, which is JSON files. I use a different um, module called NB format in which you just pull out all the information, focus on whichever cell you want. For example, here I focus on these figures, and um, that way I can get a quick uh, review of what I've done. So um, yeah, so I, I really liked it. Um, so I like using it, and I became um, lazy at constantly using this runny pie, and so I just wrote a, um, a sweet um, wrapper around it that I call Jupyter Stream. Uh, so I put it into the Git repository, so feel free to take a look. And I also wrote a, a short blog about it, which I posted already on Slack. So that's it. Thank you. Uh, so um, this is my claim, captures are dead, um, and what I mean by that is captures like this. So maybe you've seen that before, it's, it's quite funny. But <laughs> and uh, I didn't get this capture, but uh, the goal is to mark all the, the dogs and to tell them from the muffins. And <laughs> it's, it's not easy, I mean, it's, it's possible. Um, but uh, this thing here, for example, is very hard. So what I, <laughs> really, it's very hard. I have more of them. Hopefully, I have time. So my idea is, is it, that is a capture to tell the machine from the human. But is it at all possible for something that Google created that Google actually can also do this? And I made an experiment. Um, and I used the pre-trained inception model that you can just download from Google. It, it's based on uh, TensorFlow. It's very easy to set up. And I fed in uh, this dog. And I asked Google, what is this? And drum roll, what do you think? It's a Shivava. I had no idea that this is a Shivava, but obviously it is, 70%. Good, right? Second dog, a little bit harder, but more cute, maybe. <laughs> Shivava, 94%. Not bad, right? But now, this. <laughs> I did this this afternoon, and, and I was very surprised. Google has no idea what it is. I think it's a vast, but only with 5%. So it has no idea that's what it's telling us, but it knows for sure this is not a dog. Good. Second one. This is very hard. I thought Google would fail on, on us here, but that's a teddy bear. <laughs> but, I mean, 25% and then custard apple, I don't even know what that is. Um, spaghetti squash, also, I don't know. I'm, I'm, German, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> but it knows for sure this is not a Shimawa. So what I did, I uh, got more examples, and they are harder. <laughs> <They're, they're, laughs> I mean, it's all stone. This is not my joke. It's, it's a stone joke. So this one I got wrong because I thought it was a loaf of bread, but it has feet. <laughs> this actually is a dog. And it's very mean because those are all dogs' bottoms. They're dog behinds. <laughs> And I was very surprised, so let's see. I have many more of them, is that the dog versus bread, right. Let's see. So the first dog, well, f uh, no, a mistake. How does the first dog look like? This one, let's see, let's zoom in. <laughs> that's, that's really hard, right? I mean, this is, I mean, who makes pictures like this? I don't know. <laughs> I don't do this, but. It's, it tells us it's a Welsh corgi, and I have no idea about dogs, but I think it is, right? <laughs> Almost 50% from, from, from telling from the behind of the dog. Uh, 
I'm amazed. I had no idea. I, I didn't try this until this afternoon. Second dog, I think this is even harder, right? This is the one I got wrong because I didn't see its feet. Let's see. I'm running out of time, but I have to show you. I mean, <laughs> this thing. I mean, that is a dog. Uh, Oh, wait, and I think Google also thinks this is not a dog. Let's see. I'm running this from, from a command line on a very uh, not powerful machine. Let's see. Give it some time. Yeah, well, <laughs> it doesn't think it's a dog, but it thinks it's, it's, it's a rabbit or a Persian cat, but it doesn't think it's bread. So, <laughs> uh, at least, and now I tried it again the other way around with the bread thing, and this thing, I think this is the hardest one, right? Uh, well, this is very hard to, to know what it is out of context, right? At least that's what I thought. Uh, it could be a dog, but it's a loaf of bread. Let's see. And this is, I mean, I'm, I'm not faking this. You see this, right? So this is the second bread. Let's see what it tells us. Come on. L French loaf. 99%. Not bad, right? Um, I'm running out of time, but I have more samples. I'm just showing you. The, the samples. This is chicken wing versus poodle. <laughs> this, this is funny, right? I mean, this one versus this one, a toughie, right? And they're also cute. And uh, this is the final one. This is bagel versus also dog. And now this. This versus this. And I've tried, I've compared those two. With very high percentage, this is dog, this is bagel. So Google's very good at this. pre trained etc. So I would say captures are dead. And with that, thanks. <laughs>Hi, so this is something a bit different. This is uh, just a toy project. Anybody who wants to write their own Twitter bot, I didn't until recently. And why did I do it? Because I was going to run a half marathon, and I wanted everybody to know I was running a half marathon. But whilst I'm running, I can't tweet. Doesn't work. <laughs> this is the Pi Data stream, and if the live demo actually works, which is going to be impressive because, you know, this is a... <laughs> we'll see if it... Oh, yeah, no, it started. So this is actually now I'm live tweeting my lightning talk. Um, so, yeah, this is now foolishly me about three weeks ago. Um, slightly different change of pace. Um, Southampton Half Marathon. Um, I want to communicate it out. So, first up, how do we tweet? I thought this was going to be the really difficult bit. No, it isn't. Um, TweetPie to the rescue. If you've never used it, it's really straightforward. Um, I have obviously put a load of fake consumer keys and stuff there. You cannot get into my account. Um, but it's very simple. You import the authentication tool. You put in whatever you get out of Twitter. You create your own little API. And with one command, it's update status, give it some text, and off it goes into the ether that is the internet. And you get things like Adam has started his lightning talk at 1817. He's got five minutes. Who needs Emlyn when you've got something like that to do the timing? Um, the question was, though, what did I want it to tweet whilst I was going? So uh, this is a snapshot from uh, the Southampton Half Marathon from their timing group. I'm sure they're really happy that I started hitting their page. This is the final results that came through. This page the day before, or the week before, was empty of numbers there, pretty much. Um, so I just knew what I was expecting. So then it was the joy of, oh, I've got, I'm a minute in. Um, see, who needs Hemlin? Um, this is where you go back to your classic um, scraping tools. So you can see that I'm pulling in requests to go and get a web page, a bit of beautiful soup so I can go and mine it. That table is a nightmare. But eventually, after a bit of trick, working your way through, you can take it. And then the joy of pandas, as we all depend on it, happily just converts it into a nice table for me. So everything works out. Uh, but now I want to be able to monitor differences in what's going on. Um, so I actually need to store it. So I'm not using anything big, so I'm going to push it out just for the sake of it to a file. So I'm going to use SQLite, so that will take. And again, pandas happily goes to SQL, so connect to my file, pushes it out. And the trick becomes now I need to actually monitor for updates. So this is, these are the couple of functions I wrote. I want to be able to, I, I can go and get my new results I know from my web scraper. I'll go and fetch the last set of old results that I had, and then I do this little comparison, I check. And if there's something that's changed, return the row of the table that's come back um, with a little flag of has something changed, has something not changed. And if it has, then great. I can 
write a tweet. Um, and in this case, these are the things that were coming up. So I've started, or I've managed to get finally to the finish line, um, or I'm just slowly eking my way around the course. Um, so all of those are all ready. And then because you know, I wanted to make it available to anybody else from my friends, although I didn't actually have it debugged before the race, unfortunately. It only tweeted five days after the fact. Um, <laughs> hey, I'm a perfectionist. I wanted to debug it. So I put it all together in a little class um, that means that you can just put your running bib, bib number in it. We'll go and find the appropriate page. It will go through. It will do everything. It will push things out. It will pull it all back. Um, and now, having put all of that in a nice class hidden away in another file, I can now do my half marathon in 10 lines of code. Create my Twitter bot, create my runner, and whilst I haven't finished running, <laughs> just go through and every five minutes go and pull it out. And I'm only at the midway mark, but there is the equivalent of what popped out five days after the uh, <laughs> half marathon. Um, but uh, started and slowly eked my way through. So if you want to write your own Twitter bot, go for it. The world's your oyster. I think we may have our own, because this has been going through my feed all day with a slightly different account. So somebody else is using the Pi Data London tag at the moment. And thank you very much. All right, so last year at Pi Data London, I uh, managed to pack two lightning talks into my one lightning talk slot. And I thought that was kind of fun, so I'm going to try and make it my thing. So once again, I have two lightning talks for the price of one. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so lightning talk number one. Uh, we re recently released IPython version 6. IPython version 6 requires Python 3. If you're still using Python 2, don't panic. Python, IPython version 5 will continue to get bug fix re releases, and that does support Python 2. However, if you're using an old version of pip, and you go pip install IPython on Python 2, then it will try and get the newest version, which is IPython 6, and you'll get an error message saying this version of IPython is not compatible with Python 2. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is a public service announcement. Keep your version of pip up to date. <laughs> the current version of pip, I think, is 9.0.1. If you're using an older version, run pip, in, pip install dash dash upgrade pip, and that will get you the newest pip automatically. And pip itself warns you to, uh, to keep this thing up to date. All right, so slamming the brakes on lightning talk number one. That was that. Now I move on to the thing that I actually put down on the sign-up sheet, which might be Bloomberg's authentication page. No, here we go. Uh, no, don't want that. Um, one moment. Uh, not the authentication page. Where's my mouse gone? There it is. There we go. So. Leading in, this is a cool project that somebody demonstrated at um, PyData Amsterdam last month. Uh, it generates text that looks like it comes from a target language, um, but doesn't actually mean anything. Um, it's a convenient demo point for this, because, for this talk because it doesn't actually have any tests. Uh, it's just a little hobby project of the guy who did it, so it's not sort of, that's not too bad a thing. But it does have a couple of notebooks in there. Um, which, so this blog post .ipmb notebook, for example, exercises the, the library and checks that the code there is working and you know, has an example that it goes through of how to use this and some output from it. So, the tool I'm talking about, nbval, you can use the, the PyTest framework, and you add this dash dash nbval lax flag, and it will run those notebooks. And if any of the cells in the notebook produce an error, then it counts as a failing test. So this is a, a really easy way to add tests to a project that doesn't already have it. And also, to even if your project does have sort of proper tests, it's a convenient way to exercise your examples in your documentation to show that check that they're still working. So if you change your code and it breaks your examples, then your continuous integration setup can flag that up to you and tell you this example is broken. You need to go and fix it or fix the code as appropriate. And going one step further, uh, if 
I can manage two screens at the same time. There we go. Uh, so this is the, the notebook in question. And if I put in here mvval check output, so this is a new cell tagging thing that was introduced in Jupyter Notebook 5. So I've deliberately put this check output tag on a cell that doesn't have deterministic output. Uh, so you normally don't want to do this. I'm going to do it to show a failing test. Um, it will now run that. And in addition to checking that the cell doesn't produce an error, it will also compare the output from running that cell against the output that's saved in the notebook. And if they differ, then it will count that as a failing test as well. And you should see in a moment, fingers crossed, if we have time, um, that it will come up with a comparison of the output that, oh, I didn't save it, did I? So the test hasn't <laughs> failed. <laughs> if I had done this properly, then you would have seen that, um, let's see if, there's, see if there's still time before it, uh, OK, there isn't going to be time. Um, <laughs> but what you will see is that, um, yeah, there you go, failing test, um, is that it gives you a comparison of the output that you should have expected with the output um, that's actually produced. So you get a, a nice view of what's failing in your, your example tests. And I think I am out of time there. I heard the bleeper going. So thank you very much. Oh, they're gone. There you go. There you go. Uh, <laughs> hey. Hey. Okay, before I get started, I just wanted to say that I think today's proceedings have been amazing. And just before I get started, I think we owe a round of applause to all of the Orange Shirt volunteers for making this event possible. But do remember, today is not over. So as Emlyn noted, we are going to the, pu to the pub, and there will be a pub quiz. Uh, we just finished writing the questions about an hour ago. Uh, when we did this in Amsterdam, it was incredibly popular, but the questions were too easy. So we've made them very challenging for you. <laughs> now, I, plan to give, I originally planned to give a lightning talk tomorrow, uh, but whenever I see lightning talk signups, I feel compelled to sign up. I just can't get enough of myself. And if you can't get enough of me either, come to the pub quiz. I promise you, you will learn something. It's going to be really exciting. There's some really cool questions. That said, here's a lightning talk I managed to put together about something which is actually kind of useful, but nobody seems to care about. I'll tell you about it. So I keep putting certain small little projects on, on GitHub without documentation or tests or an explanation for what they are, and nobody seems to care about them. I don't know why. And so here's one example of them for something that is very small, but is actually incredibly useful in practice. It turns out that I really like technologies where you can get an enormous amount done in about 100 lines of code. I feel there's something very powerful about writing these technologies very close to either the operating system or a core platform or core language. On my computer, there's a directory called SRC. And it contains stuff like this. And if you look inside that directory, you can see something. There's a directory called code. Every time I see a package online that I like, I download the tarball for the code, and I unzip it. So I can look through the code. And in fact, there are a lot of packages on GitHub, or I use Arch for this computer. So on AUR, there are a lot of packages, and I might want to download them. So there's a lot of places where I get raw source code. Sometimes I want to tweak that source code. So for example, there's small bugs or, or key bindings which you can't change, and I just want to comment out lines here or there in the source code. And so I have a folder where I put those tweaks. Sometimes I want to build that source code. You can see there's nothing in this directory yet. But sometimes I want to build them. And sometimes I want to install this, but I don't want to install it to my system because I don't want to overwrite something the system needs. So you can see I install Node, I install Nginx, I install Postgres. That's all kind of interesting. Now, what I'm going to show you is how I actually manage to build a lot of things from source. And it's going to look really crazy, but it works for over 464 separate things that I build from source, either in order to investigate something or to debug something or as part of just getting something to work where I needed to do a small patch. It turns out that actually setting this up is very painful. And I want to be able to download the raw source code, apply tweaks separately to them, and then build them without ever losing what the original source code looked like, what the tweaks were, and, without, and also being able to determine what the install artifacts are separate from what the original source code was. Because in some cases, when you build something, it doesn't build in a separate directory. So you get a bunch of shared objects and a lot of uh, intermediate objects, and, and you want to be able to distinguish that from the raw source code. So I wrote a makefile. And the makefile kind of looks like this. And I give all the directories 
for the code, you know, the, the folders in the code directory I want to build, and all the directories for the folders in the arch directory I want to build. And I can actually do some kind of sophisticated things, because in the Python directory, I say I build both a Python 2.7 and a 3.5 with both production and dev debugging features. I install a Python with dev features and prod features, and I actually even build a separate Python for each individual package that I use out of pip if it's a major package. Now, this doesn't look like a normal make file. It uses make macros. In fact, I wrote a meta make file that has macros, and the make macros just emit make build rules to build these. And what happens when you run this is it generates an actual make file. So I have a make file that creates a make file. So in, in my make file, I say make concrete, and it builds a make file. Now, why would I go through that extra step? Well, I really like tab completion, and I really like namespacing. So this make file actually has namespacing. These are all the build directories I can build. These are all the install directories I can build, because some of these install directories are actually UnionFS file systems deduplicating each other on top of each other. This works for over 464 packages that I build. Now, the good question would be, let's see it work. So these are all the things that I currently am building on this system. It, it generated all these build directories. It generated enormous number of install directories. It generated some tweak directories. I use Arch, which has this download the source code, make a package. It has about three steps before you actually get the source code you need to build. It did all of that automatically from dependencies, from a fairly simple make file generating make file. Who's ever heard this phrase before? A fairly simple make file generating make file. <laughs> now, the neat thing is, if I want to, the dependencies are here so I can clean everything up. You can see this is using UnionFS, so it automatically figures out what it needs to mount and unmount in order to make this work. So when I do make, make all, and I do mount, and you see all my mount points, you can see there's an enormous number of mount points. Here I have a separate Python built when I do corporate training. I have a Python for just the library DNS lib, a Python just for the library curio, and they just stack on top of each other to duplicate itself, because this computer doesn't have that much hard drive space. Now the weird thing that you might wonder is, I had this install directory with all this code, right? And inside this install directory, there's even a directory called Python with all the Python versions. So these are all the Python versions I'm currently building on this portable laptop. Now the question is, how do I actually run these? Well, this all came out of me looking at the tool VirtualM and saying, you know what, I can do my own version of that. So here is, in 86 lines of code, a better VirtualM. And when I say a better VirtualM, it is way better than VirtualM. This is on GitHub. Not a single person has ever cloned this repo. It has no documentation. <laughs> it has no readme. It just has a name. But this is one of the most useful tools in my actual life. All it does is it uses the built-in env command to set up path, Library, include path, linker path, man path. It's the, most, it's the simplest stupid thing. It's for Z shell only, but you can write your own version or bash or whatever shell you want in about 86 lines of code. Let me show you what you can do with it. I installed Anaconda using the standard Anaconda installer. I say pem-p Anaconda, which Python 3, it uses the Python 3 from Anaconda. That just works. I use, sometimes I do stuff with React, so I need Node. So I can say two directories. Look, which NPM? Oh, it gets the NPM from the right place. Which Python 3? It gets that from the right place. Well, that's kind of nice. In fact, sometimes for my environments, I need to make it, I need to figure, I need to use Postgres as well. So which PSQL? Oh, it gets it from the right place. So I actually have this kind of mix and match build directories. What else can I do? Well, virtualm gets you into an environment. Well, with penv, it's just the env command with some wrapping around it. So you just do this to get into your virtual env. And to get out of your virtual env, you just do control D. Activate and deactivate are a clear indication that whoever wrote virtual env did not understand how the shell worked. This is how the shell is supposed to work. You enter a subshell and you leave a subshell. Two more slides. With NPM, you can install something like Gulp into node modules. What that gives you is a directory that's based on where your node module is, where your bin files are. With PEMV, you can evaluate an expression within the currently building environment. So I can say, use the node, PEM, the node environment, i.e. The, just the directory with the source, sorry, the user, lib, etc. Construct a path from inside that environment and then tell me where my gulp is, and it tells me where my gulp is. And so finally, you can do some fancy stuff. Has anyone ever wanted to figure out what is, what are all the binaries that exist at the very first entry in my path? Well, here, you can do that. So that's PEMV. Nobody uses it. Nobody likes it. It's 86 lines of Z shell code plus a make file that generates make files. This is one of the most useful tools for me. It works for every tool that I use. It works for JavaScript, it works for, no, it works for Node, it works for Postgres, it works for Python. It is an incredibly useful and very simple approach. If you don't want to use it, it's okay, I don't mind, but I like it. Thank you.
So, of course, when we mentioned earlier that you were going to get hired, you've now been hired into Meta Make File, uh, Inc. Um, they've raised Series A. It's amazing what you can do with the right people and the right amount of money. Thank you very much, James. Right, so we're just going to do a few thank yous, and then we'll all release ourselves to the pub. Of course, as always, we have to thank Bloomberg. Thank you very much for allowing us all of the space. Thank you. And I am to thank Continuum Analytics, Man AHL, Pivigo, JetBrains, and Delta. What do you mean, wait for the slide? Oh, right, okay. Yeah, right, okay, so we go. JetBrains, Bivigo, Bloomberg, Oracle Cloud, ManHL, and Cambridge Spark. Fantastic, good. So that's all our sponsors thanked. It, uh, thank you for all of our speakers, for all of our speakers who gave their time today. That basically makes the conference. Any speakers in the room still here? Good, we'll stand up. Get a little clap. It's Padder, it's just you, mate. <laughs> Cheers, Padder. Thank you to all of our orange uh, safety shirt construction people for building this thing. Oh, very good. And, um, and thank you very much to all of you attendees for coming along and making it such an excellent event. I think that's done. We are over time. Thank you very much, everyone.